you find that verse for me. John 16, verse number 6. And I'm going to go ahead and read, but follow along. The Bible says, But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. I'm going to read that one more time. John 16, verse number 6. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. I'm going to preach a message to you entitled this morning, When Sorrow Comes. When Sorrow Comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in the house of God. Thank you, Lord, for the people that are here, their faithfulness to you, Lord, their love for you, God. Thank you so much for working in our hearts this past week. Thank you, Lord, for those that have come this morning, the visitors that are here. Thank you, Lord, for those that come, Lord, to uh, possibly be baptized this morning. What a blessing that it is to see, God, you work, Lord, and how that you've, Lord, dealt with our hearts this past week. I pray, Lord, that you would do another work in, in this morning, that, God, you'd, Holy Spirit, that you'd meet with us, every Christian in the room, God, that you would convict the hearts for whatever the need is through the message. That, Holy Spirit, you'd give me the words you'd have me to say. Father, Lord, if anybody's here and does not know that if they die, that they go to heaven, God, would today be the day that they trust you, Jesus, as their Savior. Lord, I pray desperately, God, for that opportunity. And Lord, would they allow me to take the Bible and show them from the Word of God how they can know 100% sure that if they die, they'd go to heaven. Lord, would you please work on the hearts of those that, Lord, maybe need to be born again today. Lord, work on the hearts of Christians. Lord, may we be better because of your Word. We love you. We thank you. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before we begin a message, I'd like to read to you an illustri- a, uh, a true story. The telephone rang at the Phil Rick and Son Funeral Home in Miami, Florida. It's a true story. The secretary answered, Can we help you? The voice of the man replied, I am calling to make arrangements for a funeral. The secretary asked, What is the name of the deceased, sir? The voice answered, Me. This is a suicide. Please come pick up my body. My name is George Harper. He gave her his address and hung up. That day, Mr. Harper put a gun to his head and killed himself. He died on the first anniversary of his wife's death. This brought a tragic climax climax to 12 months of despondency over the death of his wife, Margaret. When the police arrived at his home, they found a desk calendar in his living room, opened to March 15, 1971. Written on the calendar page were these words, the day Margaret died. This true account is just a token of the picture of sadness in this world, a world that has turned away from God, a world that has refused God's recipe for righteousness and joy, a world that has forgotten the promise of Jesus, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I believe that in this world is sorrow. Sorrow is everywhere. Sorrow, give you a, a definition, is the uneasiness or pain of mind which is produced by the loss of any good or the loss of frustrated hopes of good or expected loss of happiness. It's to grieve, to be sad. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrow, but the sor- that, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. Sorrow is everywhere. If you live in this world long enough, you're going to face sorrow. Sorrow is that sadness, that intense feeling of hopelessness when something's gone. Sorrow is not uncommon, but to some, maybe in the room, you've never faced this sorrow. You've been sad, but maybe you've never faced sorrow. Maybe you've never come face to face with a tragedy that maybe the Lord's allowed into your life that brought you to tears. Sorrow is not the losing of your pet hamster, although that's very sad. My wife had a hamster. My mom had one. I'll tell you a funny story. I know this doesn't go with sorrow, but it's funny. My mom had a hamster, and she put it in the dryer. uh, uh, He was not a dryer survivor. (laughs) And uh, so we're not talking about that but sorrow that comes as a result maybe of a loss of a loved one. Maybe sorrow of a tragedy of a loss of a child. I used to know a family in Texas that their three-year-old daughter uh, was killed. She was run over by her grandma, didn't know it, fell out of the car, and she died. She told her parents the weeks before 
and I, sh I don't know if she actually was three years old, Brother Dawson, but he knows the family. She told her parents weeks before that she knew she was going to see Jesus. And they have a memorial after her. That family faced sorrow. This is the sorrow we're talking about. Sorrow fills the heart. It's, it, it's, it, it's estimated that suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the U.S. for all ages. The suicide rates decreased from 1990 to 2000 from 12 and a half suicides per 100,000 people to 10 per 100,000. But over the past decade, the rate has again increased back to 12.1 per 100,000 people. In other words, every day, approximately 105 Americans die by suicide. There is one death by suicide in the U.S. every 12 minutes. Depression affects 20 to 25 percent of Americans ages 18 plus in a given year. And suicide over a year takes the lives of over 38,000 Americans. Do you know why? Because there's sorrow in this world. Now, sorrow is not a sin. Sorrow is not something that is because of, or it's not a sin to sorrow. Sorrow is a result of sin. Look in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall be rule, or and he shall rule over thee. The first time sorrow is introduced to this world is right after Adam and Eve sinned. When they sinned in the garden, along with sin came sorrow. Just as along with sin came death. It's not a sin to die. Death is a natural part of life. But death is a result of sin. It's not a sin to sorrow. Sorrow is a natural part of your life because it's a result of sin. If you're a sinner this morning, if you know you're a sinner, guess what? Sorrow will come. Because sorrow is a result of sin in this world. Let me move on. 1 Corinthians 7.10 shows us two sorrows that there are. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. I'd like to read this to you. First Corinthians chapter seven. Or you know what? I believe it's actually Second Corinthians. I apologize. Here we are. Second Corinthians. I apologize. Seven ten. The Bible says, "For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death." So in your life, you'll have sorrow. There's a godly sorrow that will work to God's good. Or there's a sorrow of the world that brings death. That's what depression is. That's what suicide is. It's the sorrow of the world that works death. As a person, if you're not saved this morning, if you're not born again, when you come face to face with the man of sorrow, you face it alone. And that sorrow will work death. Yes, you'll get through it maybe a little bit at a time and maybe through a little bit of help. But you'll not conquer sorrow like you would if you had Christ. For a Christian, we have the victory. When sorrow comes, God will use sorrow to work in you and to do a work that He needs and bring you out of sorrow. But if you're, born again, if you're not born again this morning, can I tell you that when sorrow comes, it'll be tragic. Have you ever been to a funeral of somebody that's lost? sorrowful. I've been to funerals of people that are lost. Died and spent eternity in a place called hell. That's the ultimate sorrow. If you're not born again this morning, the ultimate sorrow you'll face is death. And you spend eternity in a place called hell. In our chapter here, John chapter 16, the disciples faced a little bit of sorrow. They relied on Jesus for everything. Jesus had been with them, done many miracles, and now Jesus is about to leave. 
And Jesus tells them this, and so because of that, sorrow fills their heart. But he, tell, but he gives them some verses in the next couple verses. He gives them some, some things to help with sorrow. There are some things as a Christian that will help you through sorrow. It will help you through that time because you have the victory. You're born again. You have Christ on the inside. You have the victory over sorrow. You don't have to let sorrow overtake you. You can have the victory through sorrow. But there are some things. Number one, John 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Number one, Jesus only speaks to those that are saved. If you're not born again this morning, you can't have these promises. If you're not born again this morning, you can't work through sorrow. If you're not born again this morning, sorrow will overtake you and result in death. If you're not born again this morning, you'll face that ultimate sorrow without Jesus. See, the blessing of being born again and being saved is when sorrow comes your way, you can hold on to God's hand. Say, God, I need you. But if you're lost when sorrow faces you, you've got to do it on your own. And ultimately, you'll have to face it on your own in death. See, as a Christian, we don't have to sorrow in death because we don't face death alone. We face it with Christ. But as a lost person, if you face sorrow and you face death, you'll face it without Jesus, which results in hell. Make sure you're born again this morning. If you're not saved, don't rely on the church like I taught this morning. Don't rely on baptism. Don't rely on church membership. You rely on Jesus Christ this morning. And if you're saved, you can take these steps and work through a sorrow in your life. Has sorrow come? Maybe you face sorrow. Maybe you're in sorrow. I tell you, Jesus can help. So number one, make sure you're born again. Number two, John chapter 16, verse number seven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go, that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Number one, or number two, you have to recognize that God knows what's best. See, the disciples, they didn't want to see Jesus go. They said, Jesus, don't leave. We need you. And Jesus said, no, I tell you the truth. It's expedient that I go. Jesus knew what was best. Jesus said, I know what you want, but I have to do what's best. In your life, you're going to come to a point one day, if you haven't already, you'll come to a point where you'll look at God and say, God, why is it this way? God, why did that happen? And God says, because it's expedient for you. God knows what's best. Too many times, Christians, what happens is something comes into our life, a tragedy, and we say, well, God, why? And we get mad at God, and we question God, and we blame God. God says, no, it's expedient. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Whatever God allows into your life, when God brings it, God knows what He's doing. We have to get on our knees and tell God, God, I'm, I don't know what's going on, but I know that's your will. And you give it to God. What happens is we get prideful. We think we know what's best. We think we know how it ought to be. And we say, God, it should have been this way. God, you should have done this. And Christians get bitter because they never faced sorrow the right way. They face sorrow through their eyes. But you have to face sorrow through God's eyes. Recognize that God knows what's best. God knows what you need. God knows when you need it. God knows why you need it. You may not understand. You may not see the full picture. But God knows what is best. Don't let sorrow be the focus. You let God be your focus. Number three, endure through sorrow. John chapter 16, verse 20, the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrow, or sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish 
for joy that a man is born into the world. God compares your sorrow to when a baby is born. I'm not promising you that it'll be easy. Your sorrow will have pain. Your sorrow will have agony. Your sorrow will have hurt. Your sorrow will have tears. And there will be times that you don't think that you can go on and you wonder why God is letting this happen to you. But can I encourage you to just endure because joy comes in the morning. The midnight hour is tough to handle. When the midnight, when the midnight hour comes into your life, you have to stick it out. It's tough to bear. And there looks like there's no light coming through. But you hold on because joy comes in the end. As a Christian, you've got to get to a point where, number one, you recognize who God is. You know you're saved and you recognize God knows what's best. But then you've got to buckle down and say, no matter what happens, I'll be in church. No matter what happens, I'll be in my Bible. No matter what happens, I'll pray. No matter what happens, I'll give the gospel. No matter what goes on, I will endure with Jesus Christ. Too many Christians quit. Problems come, a tragedy comes, and we throw in the towel. We say, I'm done, God. I can't take it anymore. I don't know why you're doing this. God says, endure. There will be pain. There will be tears. There will be hurt. Just as when a baby's born, it's travail. It takes hours. It takes long. But God says, you just endure to the end because there's joy. The result is joy. It's once said that nothing worth having is easy. When God gives you joy, it's not an easy task. Joy comes through sorrow. But see, this is the thing. Sorrow is a result of sin. Joy is a result of the Lord. See, you can have joy because of God. See, we get to where we let sorrow overtake us, but sorrow is because of our sin. In other words, we deserve sorrow. When you made a choice one day to cross that line of sin... And you sinned, and you're born a sinner. When you made that choice to sin, amen, along came with it is sorrow. When Adam and Eve made that choice to sin, they brought sorrow. Sorrow is something that maybe we don't want, but we deserve because we've sinned. God doesn't deserve to give you joy. God doesn't, shouldn't, God doesn't have to give you joy, just like God didn't have to give His Son. But God loves you. And God says, you just endure through that sorrow because I'll give you joy. What a blessing. Joy is a blessing of God. Joy is a result, is, is at the end of sorrow. You endure through it. You stick with it. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe your spouse gives up. Maybe everybody else, like Job, where his spouse says, I'll just curse God and die. But you decide like Job that no matter what, I'll not sin with my lips. I'll not give in to the devil. I'll not let the devil use sorrow to be a tool to get me away from God. I'll let sorrow be a tool to bring me closer to Jesus. When you endure through sorrow, you'll find that you are closer to God than you've ever been before. The story of a man, he said, Many years ago I made 1 Peter 2.21 my favorite scripture verse says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. The verse meant much to me, and I used it to encourage my heart to follow in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, But then there came a day when God changed my life's verse. First, there was a shocking call. Our baby joy was dead. Second, there was a lonely ride. He said, Third, there was a bridge that I crossed. When I crossed over it, something happened to my own heart and life. He said, but fourth, there was a detour sign, a detour that troubled and delayed me. And then fifth, a verse came flashing into my conscience. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good. He said, sixth, there was a funeral. And how, after, how often God speaks to His children in times of great sadness. Seventh, there was a lesson, a lesson on the frailty of life and the uncertainty of our days. Eighth, there was a work. God had something He wanted me to do, and this could only be done through a certain lesson which He had to give to me. As a result of the death of our baby Joy, God brought me to a place of service that I might never have reached had this sorrow not been mine. Read this verse again, and you remember it. 
The verse involves recognition of your place in the family of God. It involves loving God and it involves submission. Sorrow will take you to a place where you have a relationship with God you've never had before. God will use it. Amen. Don't run away from God. Let God use it to bring, him close, bring you closer to Him. Number four, John 16, 24 says, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. When sorrow comes, that's the time to pray. The best thing a Christian can do when sorrow comes is not go tell your neighbor. Don't go tell your friend. Don't even go and tell your pastor first thing. The first and best thing you can do is get on your knees in front of an almighty God and pour your heart out before Him and tell Him about that sorrow. Matthew 26, 38, Jesus gives us an example. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And Jesus had not sinned, but because sin came into the world, Jesus himself had to face sorrow. Because again, sorrow is not a sin. It's not a sin to sorrow. Jesus faced it himself. But even because of our sin, Jesus had to face sorrow for us. Sorrow is not something He had to face for Himself because He didn't deserve it. Sorrow was something Jesus had to experience for you. And Jesus said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful. And what did He do? He went and prayed. Jesus went and said, Watch with me. And he went and prayed. The best thing you can do in a time of sorrow is get on your knees before God and beg God for help. Get on your knees and cry. Tell God, I need your help. Ask God to give you the answer. Ask God to help you. Say, God, I don't understand it. And I don't know why you've let it come. But I need your help. Too often we run to the world. Too often Christians, a tragedy comes and we run to the world for help. We run to everybody else. We run to everybody and say, hey, this came, what do I do? Instead of getting on our knees and saying, God, I need help. When sorrow comes, you pray. Don't run to the devil. The devil controls the world. You run to the world for help, you might as well give yourself to the devil. You run to God. Jesus set the example. Sorrow's going to come. Get on your knees and pray. You beg God for help. Jesus said, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. When you get on your knees and pray, you have to go to God humbly and tell God, this is what I would like. And I don't really wish that it would be this way, but not my will, but thine. You have to give your will over to God in prayer. And you've got to let God have His way. Only then can God accomplish the work that He has to do in your heart. Last thing, number five. Get closer to Jesus. 1 John 1.4 1 John 1.4 says this, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. God gave His word to you so that your joy could be full. You need to get closer to Jesus through God's Word. Read the Bible. When sorrow comes, stay in your Bible. Read it. That's how you draw closer to Jesus. The disciples, what they did, when Jesus said, your heart is sorrowful, they ran away. They left God. They left Jesus when persecution and trouble and came. God says, run to me. Amen. Run to God in your Bible reading. Have you been reading your Bible? If not, you won't have comfort. Comfort comes from the Word of God. Philemon 1 verse 7. Read this verse to you. The next thing. Read your Bible. Get there. Here we are. It says, For we have great joy... And consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Do, some, do something for others. When sorrow comes, the best way that can help you endure through it, stay in your Bible 
and do something for Jesus. Do something for others. Help somebody else. That will help bring joy. God says, when you give a cup in my name, you've given it to me. Do something for somebody else. Take time and make somebody else a meal. Or buy somebody some groceries. Or spend some extra time in prayer. Do something for somebody and let God bring joy to your heart. Next, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. It says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. One of the greatest joys you can ever have is, ever have is that you lead somebody to Jesus Christ. You go out and you give somebody the gospel. Sorrow is going to come. And you're going to face it and be on your knees. But don't spend all your time in prayer. Get up and go give somebody the gospel. You watch somebody bow their head and trust Jesus as their Savior and get a hope for heaven and remind yourself what Jesus has given to you. That'll help you endure through sorrow. See, the world, when sorrow comes, they dwell on it. They sit. And it eats them up. They never do anything. They, get, they seclude themselves, become a hermit. God says, get up, go do something for God. You go give somebody the gospel. You get your mind off of the sorrow. Sorrow will pass. But Jesus will last. You get on to Jesus. You tell somebody about Christ. You give the gospel and you watch. That sorrow will pass. And Jesus will give you joy through that sorrow. Last, be in church. The greatest encourage, one of the greatest encouragements that you can have is from God's people. When you come and sorrows come, you can get around and ask people to pray. You say, I have a sorrow. And we as God's people can gather around and encourage and be a help. You'll never know the joy that comes from the house of God, being in God's house with fellowship and hearing the word of God until you've been, until you've been in that sorrow. Lots of people aren't faithful to church. That's because they choose to face sorrow by themselves. But when sorrow comes, you'll wish you had the church. In closing, remember a few things. First will come sorrow, then joy. But look at John chapter 16. Go back there. John chapter 16, verse number 33. And Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God says, You'll have problems. You'll have trials. You'll have sorrow, but I'll give you joy. And then He says, And then I'll give you peace. The peace of God that passeth all understanding. You ever seen a Christian when a trial comes and you see them and they handle it in such a way you just, you don't think, you're like, how did they do that? It's because of God's peace. The world looks at a Christian and wonders, how do you make it through? How do you endure through tough times? Suicide is rampant. Then they look at a Christian, the same thing that took a family member, the same trial that came, and you wear a smile and you have joy and they wonder why. You say, because God brings peace. A peace that passes all understanding. You may not understand, but it passes that. It's a peace that only God can give. But it comes after joy. You endure through that sorrow. Verse 20 says, Your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Sorrow is the root. But when that flower blooms, it turns into joy in your life. Praise God, the best thing though. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. Can I tell you the best thing about sorrow is this verse. The Bible says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. 
Boy, praise God. One day in your life, Jesus is going to come down and every sorrow you've ever faced, God's going to wipe it away. God's going to take away tears. God's going to take away the pain. There won't be any more death. There won't be any more sin, so there won't be a need for sorrow. Praise God, sorrow will be gone. Jesus will take it from you. You say, right now it hurts, preacher. Right now I'm dealing with it. Or maybe soon you'll come face to face and pain will be there in agony, but you endure because one day in heaven there'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more death. Boy, what a blessing. Jesus himself is going to come to you and wipe away the tears. You're going to have tears in heaven for a short time. I believe every one of us will have tears in heaven for a short time. You know why every one of us have a family member that's probably lost? One day in eternity, if they're not born again, they'll be cast into hell. Boy, that would bring tears to my eyes. One day in heaven, though, you'll have tears. And God will wipe all those tears away Himself. But you know, in, in hell is eternal sorrow. See, the blessing for a Christian is we get to face sorrow for a short time. And then one day sorrow will be gone. But for somebody that dies and spends eternity in hell, they'll spend an eternity in sorrow, an eternity of tears, an eternity of pain, an eternity of death. What a sad fate. My friend, if you're not born again, I encourage you, I would get saved. Because you'll have to face sorrow in this life and you'll have to face sorrow in the next. But for a Christian, can I give you hope? You endure through sorrow. Because you may endure sorrow for right now, but one day, God will take all sorrow away. Boy, what a blessing. Never again will we see death. Never again, no more sickness, no more pain. We'll be with loved ones and we'll never have to worry. No more tears. Are you in some sorrow today? If not, you'll face it. You're going to face sorrow. And if you take it as the world does, it'll work death in your life. But you let God have His way. You take God and face that sorrow. And I promise you, joy will come in the morning. The greatest joy that you can ever have this morning is when you get saved. If you were lost this morning and you need to be born again, the greatest joy comes from being saved and facing sorrow with Jesus. I encourage you this morning, if you're not born again, I'd get saved. And if you're a Christian, boy, you can overcome. Sorrow does not have to work death. But sorrow can in a Christian. Remember this last thing. If you as a Christian don't face sorrow with Jesus, the same work that it works in the lost can be done in you. There are Christians that commit suicide. There are Christians that face sorrow because they face it without Christ. They have Jesus. They have the answer. But they don't face it with Jesus. Can I encourage you? Face it with Jesus this morning. Let Jesus have His perfect work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you.